During our discussion on the basics of Boolean logic, we mentioned that these operations can be physically implemented using, for example, electronic components like transistors to build pretty much all of today's modern computers. Now, in the 1960s and 70s, in an effort to make computing systems more efficient, people started exploring the idea that computational irreversibility is associated with energy dissipation. So from this, a model of reversible computing started emerging. So let's take a look at what we mean by this and why it is important in the context of quantum computing. Let's take a look again at the truth table of the AND operation. So for that, we had a bit A and a bit B and all possible combinations of the bits A and B. And then we said that the AND operation, it's equal to one only when both A and B are one. So looking at this truth table, what if we wanted to figure out what A and B are based just on the output? So it is easy to see that if we were to get a one at the output, we can guarantee that both inputs A and B are equal to one. But if our output is zero, then there is absolutely nothing we can say about A and B. A could be zero or it could be one and B could be zero or it could be one. So we have all other possible combinations of A and B at the input. So this is the concept of irreversibility. So basically not being able to recover our inputs just based on the outputs. And the problem with this is that as we mentioned before, the loss of information is associated with energy dissipation. So for this model of the AND gate, we know for sure we're losing energy during the processing of information. So the question is, is there a way we can make all of our Boolean operations reversible? So let's take a look at each of them one by one. So let's start with the NOT operation. So we know that if we have A, we get A bar. And if we get zero at the input, we have one at the output, and then one at the input, zero at the output. So the NOT gate, at a conceptual level, we know is reversible because giving A bar, we can always figure out what A is. Now, an important part of the process of building reversible logic is to look at the symbols we use. So for the NOT gate, we were using this triangle with a little circle at the output. But during the construction of reversible circuits, people started thinking that this, is, uh, this symbol is asymmetric. And since reversible computing is all about the symmetry of being able to figure out inputs from outputs, uh, there were proposals to change the, that, that particular symbol. So for example, Feynman proposed just using a line with an X in it. Toffoli proposed the symbol of a circle with a plus sign, which is still used uh, today. And then another symbol that was proposed was just a box with the letter X inside of it. And, and the reason why we have that letter X will become obvious later when we start studying quantum computing. So throughout this course, we're going to use this symbol and we're gonna start calling the NOT gate the X gate from now on. So the NOT gate was rather trivial. So let's take a look at another uh, of our gates. So let's, let's look at the XOR gate. So recall that the truth table for the XOR is given by the following. We get a zero whenever both inputs are equal, and we get a one whenever they're different. Now we can see from this that the XOR is definitely not reversible the way it stands, because if we get a zero at the output, our inputs could be either zero, zero or one, one. And similarly, if we get a one at the output, it could be zero or one, and B could be one or zero. So an easy way to make this gate reversible is by adding redundancy. So one thing we could do is add an additional output that basically matches one of our inputs. So if we were to just simply pass, let's say our input A straight to the output, then now for each of the possible combinations at the output, the input that we get is unique. Notice how if we have zero, zero at the output, we know for sure the input was zero, zero. If we have zero, one, then we know the input was zero, one. 
If we have one one at the output, we know the input was one zero. And if we have one zero at the output, we know the input was one one. Now you might wonder at this point, how does this help me from a hardware standpoint to make the circuit more efficient? I mean, passing an input to the output could be considered as, you know, taking our XOR gate and simply, you know, taking this input A and connecting it straight to the output. So here we will have A X or B and here we will have A. But the way this is constructed is still using the same transistors. So it doesn't seem like reversible circuits are going to help me with energy efficiency. Well, the idea is that this is just a conceptual model and the way you would implement the gate itself will be using different physics than what we use with traditional logic. So for example, in the first few papers, it was proposed how using mirrors or using ideal billiard balls, you can construct this type of computers. But today, the way we implement this is actually using the hardware utilized for quantum computing. And we will get to that in uh, later videos. Now, the symbol that we use for this is also different. So the way we implement a reversible XOR gate is by using what is known as a control X gate. So what we do is we take the X gate we described above and apply it to our bit B, but we condition it on the value of our bit A. So basically what this represents is that the bit A is equal to one, we will apply the X gate to the bit B. But if A is equal to zero, then we will not apply that X gate and B will just pass unchanged. So let's take a look and see that this actually gives us the, the correct truth table we have here on the left. So if A is zero and B is zero, well, A just passes straight to the output, so we get a zero. And the X gate does not get applied, so B also just passes straight to the output, so we get zero. So for an input of zero, zero, we get an output of zero, zero. Then if we change B to B1, then again, A passes through and does not activate the X gate, so we also get a one at the output. Now, once we change A to B1 and B to B0, well, now the X gate does get applied, so we get a straight at the output, but then B gets flipped just like if we had a NOT gate, so we get a one at the output. So that corresponds to this row in our table. And then lastly, if we have B at the bottom, well, A passes straight through, activates the X gate, so it flips B, B, and then we get one zero at the output. So from now on, we will refer to our reversible XOR gate as a control X gate or C naught gate for short. And um, in terms of notation, uh, this is the, the symbol we'll be using, but also a very common symbol that is used is replacing the box with the X with uh, the Toffoli symbol for the, the naught gate, which is the circle with the plus. So now let's take a look at another Boolean operator. Uh, let's move to uh, the AND gate. So, as we showed at the beginning of the video, the truth table is given by a 1 at the output whenever both inputs are 1 and then zeros in all other cases. Now, trying to add just one of the inputs to pass through the output like we did for the XOR gate wouldn't work in this case. And that is because for the AND gate, we actually have three different outputs that are equal to each other. So adding a single input doesn't give us enough redundancy to fix this issue. So what we need to do is pass both inputs to the output. So this is the only way we can have unique outputs to recover the input. And the way we implement this using reversible logic is by using what is known as a controlled controlled NOT gate or a control control X gate or sometimes also called a Toffoli gate. So what we have is a CC naught gate. It's implemented again by using an X gate where what we're going to do now is basically pass A and B straight to the output. And then we have a third bit, which is going to be 
the A and B output, which is obtained by applying an X gate to a bid always initialized at zero, conditioned on both A and B being equal to one. So how does this work? Well, if we have zero and zero here, the X gate doesn't get applied. So we get zero at the output. Now, if we change B to B1, well, the X doesn't get applied because it's conditioned on both bits. So then again, we get zero at the output. Similarly, if now we have one zero, because B is zero, the X doesn't get applied. So we still get zero at the output. And lastly, if both bits are one, then that does activate this X gate, which gives us a one at the output. And we can check that this truth table matches the description of this circuit. Now, it is important to keep in mind that this control control X gate is not a reversible AND gate, but rather the reversible AND gate is a specific case of the control control X gate where we have initialized that last bit to zero. But in general, the input of a control control X gate could take both values of zero or one. So this will be the full truth table for that particular gate. Now, interestingly, if you were to initialize this value of C to one, then what we get is actually the negated output of an AND gate. Now, finally, let's take a look at how to implement a reversible OR gate. And for that, we're going to use an identity that tells us that an OR gate between inputs A and B is actually the same as taking the inverse of A and with the inverse of B and then taking the negation of that. So in terms of a circuit diagram, an OR gate can be expressed as NOT gate coming into an AND gate and then negating the output of that AND gate. So for a reversible circuit, well, we have already implemented blocks for our NOT gate and an AND gate. So it's easy enough to see that to implement a reversible OR gate, all we need to do is then take an AND gate, which we implement with a controlled controlled X gate, and then we can negate both of our inputs, A and B, initialize that bottom bit to zero, and then negate the output. Now, this last step here is actually equivalent to initializing that bottom bit to one. So let's see if this works as an OR gate. So let's say we have inputs zero, zero, then here we have one, one. That means that will activate our X gate. So that will flip this one to zero. So then we have for input zero, zero, we got an output of zero. Now let's change B to B one. So after this X gate, we get a zero. So then this control control X gate won't get activated anymore. So then that one at the bottom will just pass through. Similarly, if we flip now our bits, so we have A to B one and B to B zero, then we get zero one here. So again, that control control X gate doesn't get activated. So we get a one at the output. And similarly, if we have both inputs at one, that, that won't activate that control control X gate. So we will again, again, get one at the output. So this circuit does represent a reversible version of an OR gate. So now we have all the building blocks that we need to construct any type of logical circuit using reversible gates. So we can generalize this procedure that we just followed to implement any circuit that we want. So for example, here we can see how we can map the conventional circuit used for an adder to one that is implemented using reversible logic. Now, there might be ways to simplify this circuit and make it more efficient, but the idea is that there is a way to always map a non-reversible circuit into this paradigm of reversible logic. Now, one last thing I would like to mention is that we have stress that what's important about reversible logic is that you can identify the inputs based on solely what we have at the output. But the implication of this 
is that then we can always construct another circuit that reverses our output to give us back our input. And the way we do this is to apply the same gates we have, but in the reverse order. So for example, here we show that for the OR gate we just demonstrated, if we wanted to always recover the same inputs, well, we just apply the control control X gate followed by the X gates that we applied originally. Now in the case of quantum circuits, we need an extra step additionally to just applying the gates in reverse, but we'll cross that bridge once we start talking about the more general logic that we use when dealing with quantum systems. So that's it for this video. And if you have any questions, just remember that you can go to the website and in this about section, there's a link to a discussion forum where you can post any questions you might have. Thanks again and hope to see you in the next video.